Thank you, Brandon and worship team. You sound great today. What a great, great day. And welcome to all of our guests. I offer that as well. I'd love to meet you before the day is over. We have a lot of friends who are with us today. We're so glad you're here on this great day. So, hey, your view of God determines your response to God. What you think of when you think of Jesus will determine whether you'll follow him at all. Uh, but it also determines what kind of disciple you'll become as you imitate him, right? Your view of Jesus determines your whole life and what you think of him. It was A.W. Tozer, the great theologian. He wrote famously, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And it's true today. Whether you're a believer or not, or whether, whether you're, we're all on a journey, Wherever you are, you're skeptical, perhaps, wondering, maybe doubting, all of us, maybe in varying degrees, but your view of Jesus determines your response to him. Now, some of you know that I'm an artist. I love art, love art history. Uh, it was actually my undergrad in college. Um, and I'm curious, how many of you have ever seen uh, this portrait right here? How many of you have ever seen this portrait of Jesus? Raise your hand if you've seen it. I've talked to a lot of people uh, this week, shown it to a lot. We've shown it to staff and others. And some are like, oh, yeah, that was in my grandparents' house. Am I right? That was in the church I grew up in. I remember that. This painting by Warner Salmon, uh, the head of Christ, was done in 1940, pre-World War II. And it has been, I show it because it is the most reproduced image of Jesus in the history of the world. Half billion people have seen this, a reproduction of this painting of Jesus all over the world. For some people, I suppose when they think of Jesus, they think of this painting. Now, now what, do you, what do you see about this painting? What do you recognize about this painting? So he's, he's, looking, well, he's looking over at me. He's, he's, kind of, he's intense. He's stoic, even. Um, he's kind of backlit, like maybe he's in a studio. I'm not sure. Um, he has amazing hair. It could grow right here. I noticed that. Um, he, it's almost a mullet, but it's not quite a mullet. Um, he looks like, well, he looks like the artist. Uh, Warner, Warner Salmon is an American. <laughs> He's a Scandinavian American. And uh, another image that another generation might think when they think of Jesus is this guy. Now, not from art, but from film. This is from the Jesus film. Anybody? He's been out like 40, some odd, 45 years or so. Um, he, he looks quite American as well. But this film has been shown all over the world. I've been a part. We have shown this film in places like Africa and, and India and all over the world. And millions of people have come to faith in Christ by watching this representation of the book of Luke, which is where we've been over the Easter season, walking through uh, passages and encounters that people had with Jesus. Some of you remember about 20 years ago or so. Maybe it's this Jesus. It's the Passion of the Christ. Anybody know who this is? It's Jim Caviezel, right? who played in uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Uh, perhaps now in our day, it's, it's this guy. Anybody? Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, anybody? In The Chosen, that's right, which is awesome, by the way. So one of my favorite um, eras of art history is the, the Dutch masters, um, really the golden age of the Dutch masters, of which Rembrandt, uh, is my favorite, probably my favorite artist uh, from, from all of art history. Rembrandt did his own head of Christ, and it, and it looked like this. So this is very different than, than Salmon's um, head of Christ. And I say all of this because we, we really don't know what he's going to look like or what he looked like. But there was a group of forensic scientists who came together with archaeologists and theologians um, seeking to understand or to see what would Jesus might have looked like. And so they, they had access to skulls and skeletons in the, 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 right there in Jerusalem, in, the, in Israel, to see what might a first century Jew have looked like. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. They, they scanned a bunch of uh, skulls and they came up with a composite that, that was this guy. So this is not like Salmon's you know, painting at all, right? 
Now, we don't know. And the point here is not so much, what did Jesus look like? The point is this. What comes into our minds when we think of Jesus is the most important thing about us. And in every culture, every era, every place on the planet, every time and space, we, we, we want Jesus, we want him to look like us. We want him to act like us. We want him to think like us. We want him to be like us, vote like us. We want him to agree with us, don't we? And, and yet when we're confronted with the real Jesus, Instead of the preconceived ideas we have, it changes everything. And so today we're going to look at one of the greatest stories in the whole Bible. It was Voltaire who said, God created us in his image and then we returned the favor, right? And so today we're going to be we're going to encounter the real Jesus. We've been looking at encounters that people had with Jesus, and we're going to get two disciples who had an unexpected conversation with Jesus. Now, some of you are going to be, be aware of where I'm heading here. This is one of the most enchanted, amazing stories in the Bible, and it's found in Luke chapter 24, okay? If you want to turn there, I'm not going to look at all. Well, I'll show you some of the scriptures here as we walk through it, but here we're going to see that even still, in, in, in these, these two knew who Jesus was. They, they knew what he looked like. How about this? But they didn't recognize him because their preconceived ideas and misconceptions of what he was up to in the world didn't match up with what happened. And my hope is that all of us, myself included, even in preparation for this message, we would all be confronted with the real Jesus today. Do you know him? This question is valid for all of us because we all bring preconceived ideas and notions about who he is to the table today. So the first thing that we'll see, first of all, Luke 24, this is, this is uh, placing in context. It starts on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, the disciples do not yet know that Jesus is alive. The women, watch this, last at the cross, first at the empty tomb. The women now go to, to care for his body. They're told in Luke's gospel that Jesus is alive. They haven't yet seen him. They go back to the disciples and tell them that he's alive, that he, he, we believe he's risen. They don't believe him. But y'all consider this. With all this being said about women, okay, in the church in these days, women were the first to proclaim the gospel to the apostles God chooses women to go and to share the good news of the resurrection and their news sent a shockwave throughout Jerusalem and Israel. And that shockwave continues today. And his spirit is still on fire speaking in our world today. On this day, thousands, maybe even millions are coming to faith in Christ today because he's alive and he is here today, friends. And for some of you who have become so disenchanted that all you think is we just see the world as a natural world and you struggle with that that's outside of what you can see and measure. Friend, I want to challenge you today. Open your heart. Open your eyes because without this Jesus, your life makes no sense at all. And I want to challenge you. First, we're going to see an unexpected conversation. Okay? An unexpected conversation conversation. And I want us to open our hearts before him and say, Lord, speak to me wherever you are in your, in your faith journey. Look at verse 13. It says this. We'll show it here. Verse 13. It says that very day, two of them were, were going to, uh, to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles, take note, from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things. Okay, what are all these things? Everything that Luke's told us and what has happened. All these things that Jesus was arrested. He was taken in. He was this Trump trial that he goes through. And then he ends up on the cross. He dies on the cross and all these things. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself, this is awesome, uh, drew near, like they're walking along. Jesus comes, like, I'm just imagining, hey, what's up? You know, he just walks in. He doesn't say what's up. Um, that's remix translation that I just threw out there. Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept, watch this, were kept from recognizing him. Some have said, well, yeah, the sun's setting. They didn't expect a man who they watched die on Friday to be alive walking with them on Sunday. There's something more going on here. 
Not just that. They were kept from seeing him. They didn't know it was him because they were kept from seeing him. Now, consider this. Seven miles. Do the math. This is about a two, two and a half hour walk with Jesus, depending on where he stepped in. But look, here's a picture. This is not a painting, a picture of the road to Emmaus. I want you to imagine this. Some have been to the Middle East, uh, I mean, to Israel. So this is the road, the actual road. And they're walking on the road to Emmaus. It's getting dark. But these apostles, I mean, these disciples, okay, who were among the many who were following Jesus, they were in the core group. They knew all the apostles we're going to discover. They knew them all, all now 11 of them. They were in the inner circle. And look at what it says in verse 17. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? I love this. And they stood still like they're walking. They go. And they look very sad. Then one of them named Cleopas. We know who this is. Answered him. Now, this is interesting. My studies have have convinced me, and other scholars would say this, Cleopas is Clopas, same guy in the New Testament. This is significant because Clopas is married to Mary, who is one of the very inner circle. She's, you know, you hear about Mary Magdalene, you hear about Mary the, Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course. This is Mary, the mother of James the Lesser, okay? Not James, the brother of Jesus, of course. But this, so scholars say she and Mary were besties, okay? And so I'm saying this because I believe that Cl- that could very well be Clopas is walking with whom? He's walking with his wife. They're going back to Emmaus and the two are sad. They stop. But look at what it says. Are you the only visitor? This is Cleopas. He says, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know these things that have happened these days? And, he, and don't you love this? Jesus. Well, what things? Like, what are y'all talking about? What's going on? Is he playing them? What's he doing? He's doing what he does to us. He wants to hear from them. How do you see things? I I want to hear what's your take on it. And as we'll see, he's he's entering the conversation. Friends, don't miss this. He has entered the conversation today. He has stepped in to the journey that you're on, wherever you are in your life, wherever you are spiritually. Whatever disillusionment you're experiencing today, whatever doubt, whatever disappointment or despair you are experiencing today, maybe you're like them. These two are done. They're done. The cross was not a victory. The cross was the end of a movement that they thought was going to change everything. They're done. Three days later, we're out. And they thought. All of their dreams, everything that they had hoped for. Maybe that's where you are today. Hey, maybe you're here. You're done. It's a wonder that you're even here today. And truth be known, maybe you're here going, I, I don't even know how to believe any of this stuff. And I, I just pray the Spirit of God, and we all have doubts in varying degrees, so don't, don't let that strike terror in your heart. He's not afraid of your doubts. He's not surprised by them. He wants to speak into, and he wants to hear from you. Don't miss this. He walks alongside in your pace. He comes alongside you. He's not ahead of you or behind you. He is with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's walking walking with you. But may I lovingly suggest to you, regardless of how you are discouraged today, Maybe you have been hurt by people who claim to know the real Jesus. Maybe you are disillusioned because people that you know and love and thought loved you have hurt you. Maybe they have represented Jesus, but have not lived like the real Jesus. We've all been impacted by that. We've all lived that way and have hurt others. I I, I want to lovingly suggest today that your disillusionment, even your doubt, is because of unmet expectations. In your life. You see, the truth about who he is, it doesn't start with you. It doesn't start with others. It starts with him. And so I I want to encourage you today that now Jesus, what what we'll see is these unmet expectations they have. They thought he was going to be a military leader, essentially. They thought he was going to be a national leader. They thought the Messiah, the liberating king, would be one who comes and takes down the oppressive empire And he didn't do it. 
And indeed, he was a king. And indeed, he did bring his kingdom, but his vision was not for a small plot of land in the Middle East. It's for the whole wide world and for every person on the planet and every person in this room to come to him. See, there was a gap between who they thought Jesus was and who he actually was. And they're done. But Jesus is so wonderful. He's so gracious and kind. He meets us in our doubt. He meets us in the midst of our discouragement. And again, he is right in pace with you. Friends, he brought you here this morning. I know you th- Easter Sunday. Of course I'm here. Look, some of you, it, again, it's a wonder you're even here today. And the Lord is meeting you right now. By his spirit, he is speaking into your heart. But if you want to come to the real Jesus, you enter into this unexpected conversation with him. And you're going, I, wow, now, now I'm thinking he really is. He does exist. He is for real. But now comes an unexpected confrontation. Because if you want to know who he really is, you've got to be confronted with the truth. And that comes from him. And so what we see happen next is that this is not now this tragic end to a movement they thought they were a part of. Jesus, he shifts his tone. Watch this. Look at what he says. He says, oh, foolish ones. All right, this next verse. He says to them, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. Now, foolish ones, he's not just saying, you fools. You know, like we might say, he is, this means unthinking ones. Like, you haven't reasoned through this. This is a lack of of intellect and thought. That's what this means. So catch this. Reason and slow of heart to believe. Reason and faith. It's the mind and the spirit. It's the whole person. He says to them all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary? He's saying, this is, isn't it not clear? Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer all these things and enter into his glory? And then, y'all, think about this. Beginning with Moses, okay, the Torah, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Two hours. Jesus offering commentary on the whole Bible. How legit would that be? I mean, I... I would have loved to have heard that. For two hours, he's unpacking how it all points to him. We talk about this all the time, wherever we are in Scripture. What might he have said? (laughs) We got a hunch. In Genesis 1, he's the breath of life. Genesis 3, he's the seed of Eve that would crush the serpent. He's the son of Abraham. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. He's the great I am. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he is fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's Moses' voice. He's the law fulfilled. In Joshua, he's the one who saves. He is the Savior who comes. He is the perfect king who will reign forever. He's the son of David who brings his kingdom forever. He's the perfect judge. In Isaiah 7, it says that he's the one who was conceived of a virgin. He is called Emmanuel, God now with us. Would he have gone to Isaiah 53, verse 2? Here's a portrait of him. Check this out. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. In verse 3, he was despised and rejected of men. He's a man of suffering. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. He was pierced for our transgressions and your iniquities. The worst, vilest, most grotesque sins ever committed in this world and in your life and mine were put upon him so that we would not take the punishment of it all. He's pointing them, and he's pointing you right now and us to him right now. No wonder he said in John 5 to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now, now pause there for a moment. It's like we study the scriptures all the time here. 
And some of us need to study the scriptures a lot more than we do. But he's saying to them, you think that in the Bible, the more you know, the, the more you, you, see, you see it as a set of rules, he's talking to the Pharisees, the law and all this broken down. You think it's your own self-salvation program. You think that somehow you're going to be smart enough. You're going to be good enough. Just tell me what to do. I'll bring my stuff to the table. Then I can take credit for it, right? I become my own God. He says, but no, no, no. You, you think that you have eternal life that way. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have Zoe life, everlasting life here and now and in eternity. Friend, today you need to hear this. He's entered into your conversation. He's entered into your life. He's confronting you with the truth. And the truth is, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. This exclusive claim confronts our, our imagination. It confronts our intellect. It confronts our pride and our self-justification. And he's saying to you, his spirit's speaking to you right now to say, how's that going for you? Give up and come to me by faith. You don't have to be good enough. Praise him, it's by faith. Praise him that it's by grace that we're saved through faith and that all we need to do is believe. And he said, with just the faith of a mustard seed, I'll work with that, let's go. And he's saying to everyone here, Give your heart to him. And he's saying, especially those who've never received his grace, today's your day. This unexpected conversation leads to an unexpected confrontation. And then if you know this story, it goes to an unexpected confirmation. I love this. Verse 28, it says that they're almost home. The sun is setting. So, And then it says Jesus acts like he's going to go on. And again, I think he's just saying, I'm, I'm watching you. Get, and then sure enough, hey, well, no, 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 we want you. Wait, wait. This has been amazing. What you're sharing here is unbelievable. No, stay with us. They say it's getting late. And so now we come to the unexpected confirmation and we see in verse 30, look at this. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them and then their eyes were open and they recognized it. Now what is happening here? What's going on? I want you to see Rembrandt's depiction of this moment because it's pretty awesome. If you can see it, um, we'll zoom in close in a, in a sec. Uh, he is, yeah, here we go. He's breaking the bread open. Now, here's the thing. Rembrandt is not just the master of light and shadow. That's what he is. He's also the master of, of human emotion and passion. And he has these real delicate um, Emotions that are shared by real people in real moments, in real time. They didn't have film, right? They didn't have any of that. This is, this is a moment where Jesus is breaking the bread. And you can see th this guy's like, what? I mean, he's moving. He's like, wait. And, and, and they're both, oh, what is happening here? This is the moment. What's going on here? They've just heard the scriptures unpack for them. He's just pointed them to himself through all the scriptures. They realize now what they didn't even know before. Jesus was taken. Jesus was blessed as the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God who would take away the sin. Of, he was broken for us. He was given to the world so that we might be forgiven. Rembrandt offered another rendition of this moment uh, with this one. Where Jesus, did this, this guy just immediately, the light shines on him because now the light has come. It's like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. This is, this is the one. This is, this is him. And, and what, what's happening here is, you see, they, they saw that, wait, this is Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. Luke's already told us. You know the pattern, do you not? Church going people, you know this. This is the Last Supper. He, he, sa he said that with the disciples, he, he took the bread, he broke it. He, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. They had no doubt heard about how he reinterpreted, brought the new covenant to the Passover meal, the last Passover to the first Lord's Supper. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, 
Jesus is the one. And so then the story ends this way. Jesus disappears from their sight. And then it says afterwards, you know, here's what happens. Afterwards, they're sitting there. Jesus is gone. And they're like, ah, oh, didn't our hearts burn within us? I, I imagine both of them just kind of going, oh, man, I knew it was him. Why didn't you know it was him? I did know it was him. Our hearts were burning within us. And friends, here today, your hearts are burning within you. For some of you, your heart is burning within you. What I mean is you're, you're on the precipice of fate and you're seeing that God is revealing himself to you in ways that you are not tied here in the natural world. This is transcendent, the spirit of God among us. He's alive and he's here and he is speaking. And if you will let down your pride and say, I, I will believe, I believe. He will take you. Watch this. He'll take you. He'll bless you with his grace. And he'll forgive you. You'll have a new identity, a new purpose in life. He'll bless you. He, he, watch this. He'll break you of your pride because it's killing you. He'll break you of your need for self-justification, of validation and approval. He'll give you a new identity. He'll let you know your love for free. Let's start growing in that walk with me every day. And then he'll give you a way to the world so that people will actually see through your life what he really looks like. This is life, friends. This is our story. And it's your story. Let's all pray together. We're going to close our time with song, but I want to pause. This moment is where God is speaking in every heart here. If you have never received Christ, you've never confirmed in any way, and you want to today, you want to say yes to him, I believe. Even with all your questions, disillusionment and doubt, come to him now and say, yes, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. Friend, if you want to receive Christ right now, I want you to just raise your hand right where you are. It's not for me or anybody else. With all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, raise your hand and say, Lord, to say, here I am, Lord. I'm here. On this day of days, on Easter Sunday, I give you my life. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I give you my life. And now for others of us who are here and Maybe you've been a believer for a long time. Maybe it's more recent. If you are here today and you know that you're a disciple of Jesus, you have received his grace. Yes, you struggle to follow him and to see him for who he really is. And you still have questions and doubts. We all do. But if you say, yes, he is Lord of my life and I confirm again. And I am grateful that he rose from the dead for me and has forgiven me. And you want to say, Lord, I want to live for you all the days of my life. And today I commit again to say yes to you. I'm in. I want you to raise your hand to the Lord. Lord, here I am. Jesus, find me right here. I give you my life anew. Thank you. Thank you for your grace today. And so, Lord, we praise you. We thank you. You've been so faithful to us. I pray that each of us We'll go now with this new commission that we've been given to go and to tell others. And maybe it's just to tell a friend today, to tell someone here before we leave what you have done in our hearts as we continue to share the story of how you show up in unexpected places, with unexpected people like us. So we worship you. In your name we pray. Everyone said Amen.